Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to church. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be in the house of the Lord today. Hey, if you're able, can I invite you to stand to your feet? It's great to see you. We're going to worship and we're going to praise God today. So come on, who's ready to praise God? Come on, let's give Him all the glory this morning.
There's no one above you, no one beside you, nobody like you. There will be no other God before you. No one, no one, no one. Well, church, we're going to carry on praising this morning. Come on, who's ready to keep on praising God today? You know, we learned this song last week, Tambira Jehovah, which means come and dance to the Lord. Uh, this is your permission right now to dance as we sing this. Tambira Jehovah, Tambira Jehovah, Tambira Jehovah.
Standing, friends when you came in here today somebody gave you a little plastic pot if you don't have one please raise your hand high and somebody from the team will give you one but if you do have one then please open it and hold on to it just for a few moments inside are a small amount of non-alcoholic wine and a little cracker or unleavened bread, that's bread without yeast. These objects are symbols, they are emblems, they are symbols of a truth so great, so spectacular that if you embrace it for yourself that it will transform your life. The bread says I am not alone. I am in Christ and I am part of the body of Christ which is His church. On the wine, the wine speaks of the fact that by shedding of the blood of Jesus He has won a victory for me. Victory over sin. Victory over death. Victory over hell. And now as we worship the Lord together in this next song, as we 
sing and declare that victory. Let's partake. Let's imbibe. Let's take hold of these emblems in remembrance of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. come before you with thankful hearts this morning that as we reflect on the good news of the gospel once again you were victorious on the cross you conquered sin you conquered death and we are free in Jesus name and we come and we say thank you again today in Jesus name amen amen what good news for us to hear today please Feel free to take your seats. Oh, what a great time in worship. Thank you, worship team, for 
serving us so well as you do week in, week out. Appreciate you massively. Well, right now, Heart Youth Year 7 and 8, you're already making your way out. That's great. You can head out to your group today. I want to take this opportunity to welcome us all to church, but really to give a special welcome to anybody who might be visiting us for the first time or, or maybe you've recently joined us. We're thrilled you're here. It was incredible to see so many students at our student lunch last Sunday. A special welcome to you. If you're a student and you're coming and you're visiting Heart Church, we're thrilled that you're here. And for anybody who is new, we have our Get Involved stand in the atrium cafe after the service. Please feel free to head over there. If you've got any questions, maybe you want to get connected, they would love to connect with you right there. On the topic of students, just to say next Sunday, we have another student lunch. Free food, hello somebody. Um, And there's a whole load of things, as you can see, going on for students at the moment within Heart Church. We'd love to invite you to come along to those, be part of those. Um, Just to mention that today, so student lunch is next Sunday, free food. And this Sunday, we have got a YA hang still happening after the service. So if you are new and you want to be part of that, head through to our Atrium Cafe. You'll see our YA stand. You can head over there and go out for that YA hang today. But not free food today, free food next Sunday. So note that one, note that one down. Hey, well, we've come to the moment in our service where we're going to bring our tithes and our offerings. And for those of us who call Heart Church home, this really is a moment of worship for us. And it's absolutely fantastic the amount of people who have transitioned to give in online. And the ways to give are going to come up on the screen behind me. But just to say that there is actually a a most cost-effective way for you to bring your giving, and that is via bank transfer. So that might look like a standing order or it might look like bank transfers that are done manually, but that is actually the most cost-effective way for you to give. As you can see, there's different ways to give, um, but some of the ways to give do incur extra costs, extra fees uh, in managing the transaction. So if you're a regular giver and you're thinking, ah, I'd love to give in the most cost-effective way, then that is a great way that you can do that. If you head to the website heart.church forward slash giving, you will see more information on there. At the bottom of the page, you can actually see all the fees that are connected with the different ways of giving, but you can also see on there the bank transfers. Maybe you want to set that up. Maybe that's something you would like to do. As I say, the ways to give are on the screen. And can I just encourage us as we come in this moment and we talk about it as a moment of worship, it's such a moment of thankfulness for me in this moment. As we bring in our giving, as we get to give, we also get to reflect on God's generosity towards us. So as we take this moment in our giving this morning, can I encourage us with a joyful heart, why not take a moment and say, thank you, God, for your generosity towards me. So we'll take a minute right now and feel free to give. Use the ways to give on the screen. There's there's, there's contact that's given at the back and uh, some pots back there as well. Let's take a moment and bring our giving. trust we have all had a chance to give. Would you stand with me as we pray over our giving today? God, as we've taken communion this morning, we've reflected on your generosity towards us in giving everything for us. And as we come in this moment, Lord God, we get to give, Lord God, we get to sow back. And we thank you, Lord, that you have poured out your generosity on us. And that as we give in this moment, Lord God, our giving reflects something of you. And we come in this moment and it is truly worship and we bring our giving towards you. And we pray, Lord God, that you would do with it whatever you can, Lord God. You would enable it to go further than we could possibly imagine for your kingdom in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. 
Hey, well, we are going to release Adventure Kids Noughts of Fours now, so you can make your way to this corner of our room and our team will point you in the right direction for your groups. But for the rest of us, let's stay standing and let's, why not move out your seat and, and say hi to somebody this morning. Let's have a moment of connect. So great to see everybody connecting. Please feel free to make your way back to your seats. Great to see us connecting. Please feel free to stand as well because we are going to worship in just a moment. That's great. And let's, um, let's continue these conversations in the atrium after the service. Maybe you met somebody you can grab a coffee with. That's awesome. Hey, well, right now we're going to worship God. And then just after that, we're going to have our second video as we celebrate Black History Month. So this is part two, which will be followed by an item that the team have prepared afterwards as well. But just before that, let's use this moment. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus right now and let's worship him. You come at the right time when I least expected, never behind. So why would I be surprised when you deliver every time on mountains? You stay the same, you stay the same in valleys alone. You never change, you never change. And I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident and seasons change. Your faithfulness remains Great is thy faithfulness So you go
present God of my future You write my story You hold it all together God of my present God of my future You write my story You hold it all together exalt your name and lift you high Lord and I pray that we will continue to be blessings for your kingdom in Jesus name amen why don't we be seated as we watch the screen thank you hands held high what does it mean when we sing no one nowhere but if we take it way back to the songs of the spirituals laying down the tracks of the underground railroad wade in the water a cry for freedom and one day leading the way for a blues singer, Thomas Dorsey, to change the game. The father of gospel music, a black hero of the faith. All he wanted to do was make songs with a message. He paved the way for gospel music on the American airwaves, for the blessed and highly favored Clark sisters, credited for helping to bring the gospel music to the mainstream. The African-American expression of the universal gospel message. Meanwhile, in the motherland, voices are lifting up as more and more brothers and sisters are turning their lives to Christ. A joyous celebration is erupting in Southern Africa, while Sinatch in Nigeria cries, Waymaker, Miracle Worker. Black heroes of the faith, influencing and shaping gospel music, lifting a voice as one to the one who deserves all the praise. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me. Cause I want to see my Jesus 
Go God's way the rest of my life. See, I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Sing born, born, born again. Born, born, born again. Thank God I'm born again. Born, born, born again. Born, born, born again. Thank God I'm born again.
great to give God praise in this place this morning. We give you our praise and our adoration, God. You are our way maker. You are our purpose. And we add our amen. Amen. Well, let's show our appreciation to the whole worship team. Musicians, singers, absolutely fantastic. We go to a great church. What a great morning we are having together. Uh, please take your seats. It's so lovely to be here. My name is Tamsin, for those of you who haven't yet met me. And uh, I have the privilege this morning of um, sharing some thoughts from the Bible. And if you were here last week, uh, Pastor Malcolm um, led us brilliantly and spoke to us. We're, we're focusing a few weeks on women and where women feature in the Bible and how women uh, feature in leadership and what that looks like for Heart Church for us as a family. So if you missed Pastor Malcolm's preach last week, I would encourage you to go and watch that on YouTube um, so, because as Pastor unpacked uh, his heart and his vision for leadership within our church uh, family. Next week, Andrew Copsey has the privilege of unpacking the Bible. So next week, you are not going to want to miss this either because Andy is going to unpack uh, some of those difficult scriptures um, about women and some of those scriptures that we're not really quite sure how we should interpret. And so uh, Andrew's going to unpack those and help us understand those from a good biblical point of view. And this morning, I have the privilege of talking about women in the New Testament and just beginning to see and, and look at where do women feature in the New Testament when we're looking at Jesus what did Jesus think about women and how did Jesus include women in his ministry and in the early church so as we're looking we're going to be looking a lot at the New Testament today and I really want us to understand the narrative of the New Testament is actually about the salvation it's actually Jesus has come to earth to outwork his salvation plan for humanity so the whole story throughout the New Testament is about pointing to the Messiah it's about people understanding that Jesus is the Son of God that he has come to save people that he has come to restore humanity back into relationship with God and that is what we see featuring that's the whole kind of narrative all the way through the New Testament, which is going to be underpinning everything we talk about today. And I just want to start very simply with looking at Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, in a few weeks' time, believe it or not, I know some of you will have started, but in a few weeks' time, we're going to be coming towards Christmas and looking at the nativity story. And yet I feel that Mary, as the mother of Jesus, needs getting out of the box much more regularly than in December because she was absolutely highly favoured among women. And right from the beginning, we see that God's intention was to include women in the salvation plan in the, in the gospel story. So her significance is huge and so much more than, you know, getting on a donkey and going to Bethlehem and giving birth in a stable. There's so much more to Mary. Now, I'm, I want to read quite a long quote, but um, I would not be able to say it better than this lady. There's a, a lady called Lucy Pepiat. She's a female theologian and she has done a, a lot of study around Mary. So I want just to read this to you and begin to understand from the beginning of the New Testament, God's intention for women. It says, Jesus is made of her. He's not just in her. He is made from her and not just through her. Mary is not simply a receptacle of the divine, housing him, as it were. She supplies his humanity from her own body. Her blood forms him. Her food nourishes him. Her breasts feed him. How else would Jesus be connected to the line of David through Mary unless the baby was truly hers, albeit born of the Spirit? The physical connection to Mary is the basis of the story of salvation. The proof of our own flesh, our souls and our bodies can be redeemed and cleansed and resurrected. And this was all through a woman. There are three creation stories of humanity in the Bible. The first is that humanity is made in the image and likeness of God. The second is that a human is formed from the dust of the earth and woman is taken from the man and she is flesh of his flesh. The third is that humanity is reborn through a saviour who is born of a woman and he is flesh of her flesh. When God, come, when God chose to come to earth, he chose the hiddenness of a woman's womb. When God chose to take on flesh, he chose to take this flesh from a woman. Just let me pause there. I find it fascinating that God's God. He created the heavens and the earth, the universe. He created the fish, the 
beasts, he created plants, he created everything. God could have chosen to manifest himself however he wanted to. He could have walked out of the desert one day as a fully formed man. He could have done that. And yet here we are, him choosing to uh, humble himself and be born from the flesh of a woman. So when God chose to appear, he chose to come as a baby, entrusting himself to a woman's body to be born and to a woman for his care and nurture. Through a man, God reveals himself to us, yet through a woman, God makes the connection to humanity. There is no doubt that in this ancient world, this represents an elevated status for women. Mary stands in the great line of prophets, judges, and leaders of Israel, appointed by God to fulfill his purpose, first to his own people, and from there to the whole of humanity. I absolutely love that. I have read that quite a few times. If you want a copy of it afterwards, you can come and find me, and I'll let you know where to find it. But I love the fact that God actually took limited himself, put himself within the care and nurture of a woman's body and that he makes the connection to humanity through a woman. So right from the outset, we're seeing that God is demonstrating his intentions of how women are to be included in the salvation plan of history. God, uh, yeah, it's God's intention right from the beginning. So now I want to move on when Jesus uh, starts his ministry. How does Jesus include women? How does he elevate them? How are they present in every function of the early church? So let's look. Jesus had men and women disciples. And I think I can already hear some of you saying, no, come on, Tamsin, let's stop right there. We all know he picked 12 men and there was not a woman in sight. We're going to look at, there are, there are some women and we're going to look at that. But just as a side note, the fact that Jesus chose 12 men was actually because he had to. He was fulfilling the ancient law, the prophet the, the, of, of the 12 tribes of Judah, uh, of Israel, sorry. The 12 tribes of Israel. God was fulfilling that. So Jesus had to pick 12 Jewish free men to be his disciples because he was fulfilling the law. Jesus, remember, came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So actually, it was symbolic that Jesus was choosing 12 Jewish men. He wouldn't have chosen a Gentile man. He wouldn't have chosen a slave. He was choosing 12 Jewish men to declare that he was the Messiah. So we can see that that's why Jesus had 12 men disciples. At the time, you know, he wouldn't have chosen anyone else apart from 12 Jewish guys. So we're okay with that. So let's look at Matthew. Matthew 12 from verse 46, it says, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So, Already, this is revolutionary. So in a Jewish time when women did not have equal rights to study the Torah or be active in the religious community, Jesus is already saying, like Jesus would not have said, here are my mother and brothers and sisters if they weren't there because that just wouldn't have been done in the culture of that time. So Jesus is already explicitly saying that women are included and when he looks at his disciples, he already sees women there. He didn't have to mention it, but he did, because I think already Jesus, let's not forget, Jesus was radical in his time. Jesus was already turning heads and people were noticing, hey, hold on a minute, this guy's doing things differently to our culture. This guy's like kind of upsetting the apple cart here and doing things differently. So Jesus is already mentioning the fact that there are women disciples. In Luke 10, it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. And again, this is revolution. We read that and we get all caught up in like who's cooking the dinner, what's happening, she's the one that's taking the easy route. But back in the day, 
This would have been, oh my goodness, Jesus is letting a woman sit at his feet and learn. And that would not have gone unnoticed in the time of, um, of the culture and in the early church. So he's, Jesus is allowing this woman to, to sit and learn from him, a place in Jewish culture that's reserved for men only, where they sit and they learn from their rabbi, from their teacher. So Jesus is affirming her place and her freedom to become like him. She's saying, if, if it's kind of you're sitting at my feet, I'm allowing you to learn from me, and actually you are going to then become like me. So this was huge that Jesus was defending Mary's right to learn. And it would be getting people's attention at the time. That Jesus would rather Mary sit and learn from him than he was actually more bothered about that than what kind of supper he was going to get. Now, it also talks in the New Testament, the early church were taught about hospitality and doing all of those things well, absolutely. But this is a, a pivotal moment where there's a woman allowed to sit, allowed to learn from the rabbi, allowed to learn to become like him. So Jesus is indicating to everyone that we are all equal in the eyes of God. It's not, this hasn't been excluded from the Bible text. This is for us to understand. And it would have been even more noticeable to the first century readers. So we've got women disciples. We've got women learning from Jesus. We've got women um, being around him and included. Let's look at how women actually supported Jesus' ministry. In Luke 8... It says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So, Again, not only are we seeing Jesus had women disciples, but actually Jesus, were, uh, that Jesus is allowing women to be involved in his ministry. In fact, they are also supporting his ministry. Again, this is outrageous in the time and day when Jesus was alive. We need to remember that, that we're reading this in the context of a different culture to 2022. So, this is the right, gospel writers are being explicit for this, is that, you know, I loved Heart Women on Friday for those of us who were there and we looked at, gosh, the wide range of um, jobs and parts of the community that us as women find ourselves in and where we are a bring influence. And I think that this is incredible that actually right here that Jesus is also seeing this and seeing that there are women in different parts of um, society. So you've got Mary, Magdalene, who had seven demons come out. Joanna, the wife of Jesus, she's the manager of Herod's household. So she's a woman of influence. She has come from somewhere that, um, you know, she is already in her, society, in her culture, has elevated status. And yet these women are able to travel alongside Jesus and support him and financially back his ministry. So we've got women involved in Jesus' ministry there. And I think this is fascinating because... Again, Jesus is intentionally liberating women from their time, from their generational viewpoint where they wouldn't have been able to speak, they wouldn't have been allowed to um, be independent, they wouldn't have been allowed to do a lot of things. Jesus is saying, okay, so my gospel, my plan for salvation is actually open to everybody and anybody. I love we've, we've got examples of women as witnesses who actually got it that Jesus was the Messiah. In the New Testament, there are two confessions. Um, there's one from a man and one from a woman of them understanding when they confess, oh, Jesus, I see that you are the Messiah. One was Peter in Mark 8. But let's look at John 11. This is Martha. When Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Again, so um, interesting that the, the gospel writers have chosen to keep that in, that we have a woman who actually, she, she got it. She understood who Jesus was. She was understanding his teaching in all of its fullness. I love that women were the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. And they were the first to proclaim that Jesus had risen from the dead and that he was alive. 
He shows his resurrected body to women first. Let's look at John 20. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned towards him. Sorry, let me give you a bit of context for this scripture. This is when the, um, you know, the disciples are grieving Their saviour, he's died, he's been put in a tomb. And they're like, oh, maybe he wasn't who we said he was. What's happening? And they're in that period of silence, in that period of waiting. We're not quite sure what's going on. And the women had gone to anoint the body and discovered that the body was missing from the grave. And this is where we pick up this story. Where Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him. Just a little side note there. I love the fact that when she heard him say her name, she recognised his voice. A little side note here. If you're aware of Jesus speaking your name, I'd like to think that you know what that sounds like. I'd like to think that when you hear Jesus calling your name, you're like, oh, I'm here. What do you want to say to me? Because Mary instantly recognised Jesus' voice. Sorry, let's go back. Sorry, people operating this screens messing you around Jesus said to her Mary she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic Rabbani which means teacher Jesus said do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news I have seen the Lord and she told them the things he had said to her So at a time when women's testimony is not trusted, a time when a woman could not give an account for herself in court, Jesus is entrusting the most pivotal part of the salvation story to a woman. The retelling of the whole of his um, being rising from the dead, he entrusts that to a woman. How exciting. The gospel writers could have written something else, but they had to write what happened, and they haven't left it out. I also love, if you look through the New Testament, there are things that aren't there. So, like, we never, we've not got a parable about the problem with women. (laughs) I mean, we probably could write a few of them ourselves, but we, we haven't got Jesus talking about the problem with women is, and actually how we should be treating them. He, that's not there. Jesus never put women in a different place to men. He never condescended or patronised women. In fact, the the opposite was clearly modelled by Jesus. And although today we're looking at women in leadership and the function of women in church, if we look across Jesus' ministry, we can see what he thought about women and how he chose to elevate them. Because, you know, there's the woman with the issue of blood. He never made her feel guilty for touching her. He he, He treated her with worth. He respected her. There's the woman caught in adultery where Jesus didn't condone her behavior, but he didn't didn't rebuke her. He saw her and saw her value and her worth. We've got many times and accounts in the New Testament of where Jesus sees women and recognizes them and meets them at their point of need. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that actually he treated men and women exactly the same. He treated us by the same standards that our inequalities of our character Uh, Not due to our status, not due to why we were born into money or born into class. Nothing to do with that. Jesus looks at our heart and our character. And that is the most beautiful thing about him. So we look to Jesus as our example and we can clearly see he included women on every level. In his ministry, part of his ministry. And um, they they had the opportunity to be involved alongside him. So it's no surprise when we look at the early church, when Jesus ascends to heaven and the the early church is growing and rapidly spreading, it's no surprise there that when we see that women actually also are included on every level. So it's also worth noting when we read the New Testament that if you, let's just imagine we were actually back there, okay? Let's imagine that we had walked with Jesus, we'd seen some of the miracles, maybe we'd had a miracle happen in our own life. We're like, oh my goodness, who is this man? Is he the Messiah? I think he's the Messiah. Oh my goodness, we've just crucified him. Oh my goodness, he's just raised to dead. And now he's, he's ascended to heaven and he's told us he's going to come back. And we're like, oh, can you actually imagine if you were there in that time, like you have no idea he's coming back. 
tomorrow, next week, two years' time? I have no idea. So the excitement and the anticipation within the early church was like, oh, like, it's been a, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride these last few years. And, and I need to make sure that everybody I know knows about this good news, knows about this saviour, because I'm not quite sure when he's coming back. That could be tomorrow. And if it's tomorrow, then we've, we need to get on because we've got an important message that we need the world to hear. I think that's, again, another challenge for us is that we've probably slipped into a little bit like, well, he's coming back, but I don't know when. So we'll get round to telling people the good news of the gospel. But the truth is, church, Jesus is coming back one day for his bride. We, ha- we are carrying within us the hope of salvation. We are carrying within us the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is our salvation. And we have got that message to tell. So here we are. Let's, let's imagine Heart Church. Let's imagine we've been transported back and we are the early church. So the, actually the main thing is like we just got to get this message out there. We're not maybe looking at kind of correcting society and culture and let's look at, look at like let's bring in the rights and let's, let's address these situations. No, no, no. Actually, we're, we're just going to get on with this one thing, the main thing, and that's to tell people about Jesus. So I just want us to remember that when we're thinking about the early church. They were on with a big, big plan. But we can see women mentioned in the New Testament, and they wouldn't have been mentioned if they weren't there, and they weren't important. There's Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla's a woman, and they are church planters with Paul. Now, it says that her her name um, comes up four times in the New Testament, and they talk, if you read the commentaries and you do some studying, that... Traditionally, we would often say, if we were talking about a couple, we'd say a man and then we'd often say the man's name first and then the woman. It's just the way life has gone, I guess. But actually, Priscilla's always mentioned first because they led to believe that Priscilla was actually like a great teacher, a great church leader, a great church planter. And actually, um, so she has significance in the Bible. There's Philips has four daughters who are all prophesying in Acts 21. There's women prophesying to the whole church in 1 Corinthians 11. Almost certainly had a teaching element to it. There's Junia, who's an apostle. Now, there's been big debate over whether we've made her name masculine over the years and whether, we, whether she was actually a woman. Well, if you look back in the original text, she was a woman and she was an apostle and described as outstanding among them in Romans 16. So there's Phoebe, who is a deacon, which is the same word that Paul uses for himself in ministry. It's in Romans 16. And then there's Nympha and Chloe and Lydia are all named as leaders of churches in their homes. So there's many women mentioned throughout the New Testament in Paul's letters as he's writing. He instructs us to, to welcome them, to listen to them, to regard them well, to regard them well. So women play a vital part in the New Testament and in the growing of the early church. Fantastic. So although we're talking today about women in leadership and we can see, if we're looking at our New Testament, we can see that actually, if we're taking our example from Jesus, if we're following him, that actually he elevates women. Actually, he allows women to operate in these areas and in these positions. But I think the beautiful thing about Jesus... Well, hold on a minute, let me go back for a second. And I do think there is a a point to say that as women, we need to therefore know that we bring our voice. We need to therefore know that we bring who we are to the church. We bring who we are to our jobs. We bring who we are to our families. But we also bring who we are to God and see him as uh, we need to see ourselves as God sees us. And we need to use our voice and we need to be able to bring the salvation plan of God to whatever area of influence we have been put in. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is he didn't see inferior. He didn't see second class. He didn't see Greek or Jew or slave. He didn't care whether you were a leper, whether you were a woman with an issue of blood, whether you were a teacher, a Pharisee. He didn't, he didn't really care. His message was for everybody. And I just want us to have a moment, actually, church, where we are looking, as I say, we're looking at the New Testament, we're looking at women in particular. But see, Jesus was was here for all of us. 
In Galatians 3, 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we belong to Christ, we are all heirs. If we belong to Christ, we are all heirs, regardless of our background. See, it doesn't really matter whether we've been brought up with Catholic thought, beliefs, whether we've been brought up with no faith at all. It doesn't really matter whether you come from a middle class family or a lower class family. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether you're English like me, whether you're Polish, whether you're Zimbabwean. It doesn't matter. God looks at us and he sees his righteousness. God looks on us and sees a son and a daughter bought with a price that's an heir in salvation, that one day we will sit at the right hand of God, that we will sit and have eternity declaring our praises and bringing our worship to God. And that actually all of us have a part to play in this salvation plan, that all of us have friends and neighbours and work colleagues who don't yet know the good news of Jesus. And we all have our part to play. I said on Friday to the to Heart Women, you know, I'm not going to be in a lot of your places of work. Pastor Malcolm can't visit everyone's places of work and give the gospel message. We can't, we can't do it because it's not physically practical. But God has placed you exactly where God has placed you because you are part of his salvation plan. You are part of this narrative of the, like, of the church growing and spreading for people finding out who he is. So we're all welcome to be part of this salvation story. We're all welcome to receive his salvation and to play our part in it. I love the fact that Heart Church, we're a church for the whosoever. We're a church of the broken and the messed up. We're a church family full of people who know that we need Jesus in our lives and that Jesus has made the difference. I'd love us to just take a moment Gideon's going to come and help me, I think, from somewhere. But I'd like us just to take a moment. I'd love you just to consider, when you think of Jesus and you think of yourself, how do you, how do you think? How do you think Jesus sees you? Jesus sees you as precious. Jesus sees you as deserving of his love and his grace and his kindness. Jesus might see your mess, but that doesn't put him off. Jesus welcomes you with open arms and says that his salvation is here for you. His kindness is here for you. His redemption is here for you. His joy, his peace is here for you. So we're just going to take a moment. The worship team are going to sing just to facilitate us to have a moment with God doesn't matter how long you've been coming to church. doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. I want you just to take a moment to think that Jesus sees you. You are significant in his eyes. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He welcomes you. Regardless of our sex, regardless of our background, this message is for all of us. So let's just take a moment.
as the worship team is singing, just allow God. Allow God to be ministering to your soul. Allow these truths, the truth of these words, to sink in and marinate your heart and your soul. You are loved. You are chosen. You are seen by God. The creator of the universe knows you. He created you. He knows you intricately. someone here who's thinking that they're a mistake and they can't see past that I need you to know that however you found yourself here this morning whatever your background is you're not a mistake your days have been ordained by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords he knows you your name is written in the palm of his hand you are dearly chosen you are dearly loved Thank you that you see us, God. Thank you that you know us. Thank you that you've placed us where you've placed us and that we each have our part to play. We each have our voice to use. We each have our passion to outwork in order to bring your good news to the people around us. Amen. Amen. I just want to take one moment, Heart Church, and just... Um, just to say, you know, if, if you would value prayer at the end of this morning for anything that has um, been brought up this morning, then by all means, the pastoral team are here, the prayer team are here, and would love to speak and pray with you. But I just want to take a moment and just speak to people in the room who aren't sure whether they know God or not, not sure whether they'd call themselves a Christian or not. And I want to give you opportunity this morning as we've been talking about the salvation plan of God. I want to give people here in the room an opportunity to, to declare that actually, yes, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Saviour. And very simply, I'm going to pray a prayer. Once I've prayed my prayer, I'm going to ask people to put their hands up. And if you're praying this prayer for the first time and you are coming to accept Christ as your saviour, then I would encourage you to take all of your courage and put your hand up. We're going to very simply put a book in your hand and help you on the next steps of getting to know God. So here's the prayer. Father, I acknowledge I've done life my own way, and yet I understand that you are my saviour and that I want you to be Lord of my life. So I say I'm sorry, and I bring myself back to you ask for your forgiveness ask that you would put me on the good path to knowing you and understanding who you are amen if you've prayed that prayer for the first time if you just want to pop your hand up one of our team will just come and put a book in your hand it's fantastic fantastic to see people responding to god Fantastic. I'm going to hand back to Andy now, but Heart Church, let us carry this good news with us. We have good news that we are all to share and to spread amongst the people that we know and work with and live next door to. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamsa. Can we just celebrate people responding to Jesus this morning? Truly incredible. We celebrate with you this morning. And if that's you, maybe you put your hand up, maybe you didn't. But if you prayed that prayer this morning, we'd really love to help you on your next steps, on your journey. That might look like telling a friend, hey, I, that was me today, I responded. Or it might look like coming just over here, we've got a response lounge with some of our pastoral team. It might look like coming and have a conversation, say, hey, that was me. I'd love for somebody to pray with me today. Maybe you need to rush off or maybe you responded and you're joining us online. You can head to heart.church forward slash response and there's some steps on there that can help you too. Hey, I just want to echo what Tams has just said. If you, if you would value prayer, it's so easy, isn't it? Just to go about our weeks and head on to the next thing. Can I encourage you just to come and make use of our pastoral team and receive that prayer this morning? Can we thank Tamsin for bringing that incredible message? Thank you so much.
appreciate you. Well, church, church will continue in our atrium cafe in just a few moments. Don't forget, we've got our YA hang, but I'd love just on the back of that message just to pray for us as we go out, as we carry that message to our sphere. So maybe you could stand with me and I will pray for us today. God, I pray the blessing of the Father, the blessing of the Son and the blessing of the Holy Spirit over us, your church today. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be beacons of hope, that we would be carriers of your light, Lord God, that we'd be bringers of your joy, Lord God, that we would carry this message, the wonderful gospel into the spheres that we go into. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be blessed, church. Have a great week.